Authenticity means jack shit to me. The word authentic right now to me means that whatever I like. Because what's, what's authentic to me doesn't mean it's authentic to you. Even if you grew up in Taiwan. If you grew up in Taipei, your go-to pig's blood cake is a steamed pig's blood cake dabbed with chili sauce, little soy paste, peanut milk, and cilantro. Is my experience more authentic than yours? No, it's not. Whatever I like or whatever I want to serve, that's authentic to me and authentic to us. We're in Chinatown where this is, uh, what? Where the f are we? We're in Grand Street and uh, Elizabeth, going to the Deluxe Meat Market. I get all of my meat from Chinatown. Chicken, some of our pork is from Deluxe Meat Market. Best market in New York City, don't at me. Fish section, meat section, boom. Grind it up or what? No, no, no. I'll just take them as is. It's really cool when you get to work with the next generation of Chinese kids. Danny understands what I'm trying to go for. Even though he does have some restrictions given to him by his predecessors, he tries to go above and beyond. That's yeah, a good thing we came early. At noontime, it's Auntie's boxing you out. I think it's very important for me to buy from Chinatown directly is because it was a place where I always went when I was homesick during college when I had just come to the States. It gave me a, a level of comfort, and the more time I spend in New York, the more connected I feel with the Chinatown community. We opened up 886 in 2018, July of 2018. So it's been two and a half years, even though I only counted as a year and a half because of the pandemic. So we're on Baxter Street, getting noodles. This is fresh noodles I've been getting since 2016. Just giving away all my secrets today. Kenny, can I get 40 pounds, please? Yeah, thanks. So they make them in-house every morning. Super fresh, delicious, bouncy, slurpy. Q. We have a new restaurant coming later this year. It's in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. For that restaurant, we're recipe developing right now. And there's one recipe that I think is really cool. It's a whole chicken deboned with the skin on, intact and deep fried. We're definitely still finalizing the recipe for it, but I think we're pretty damn close. It's very important for me to showcase chicken raised by the Chinese farmers. It's a different flavored chicken. The meat isn't as quote unquote tender. It's not the conventional tender, but it's still delicate and delicious. Everything's intact. The feet, the head, don't freak out, but also, you know, the guts. There's still a little bit of excess fat here, but you can tell how yellow it is. You know, Americans, they go through the labor of deboning an entire bird, and then they make turducken. I don't know, man. It's questionable. Leave it to the Taiwanese kid to show you guys how to respect your own labor. And right now, I'm gonna press down on the chicken to loosen the spine before we spatchcock. That sounds good, right? It's like a massage. And now we take off the spine. You always wanna aim for the chicken ass. This is the chicken ass. In Taiwan, we call it the seven mile fragrant. So it's so fragrant, you can smile it from seven miles away. The most annoying part of this process is trying not to f up the chicken because one mistake, the whole thing is pretty much ruined. I'm romanticizing it as like a five order a night kind of thing, first come, first serve. That's such a bitch to do. I've practiced for so long and it still takes me like 12 minutes for a chicken. I've never seen anybody put a whole deboned fried chicken on the menu. It's just something nobody does because it's so fucking time consuming. Another thing we need to do that we haven't done. You see, this is the leg, but right here, there's a small pocket. Because we're using a wet dredge, the wet dredge will go into this pocket and steam instead of fry. So what we need to do is to flatten it so that there's more surface area. We are marinating the chicken, super simple. Salt, sugar, MSG, white vinegar, and some baijiu. Alcohol in Chinese cooking kind of gets rid of the gaminess of protein. This is sweet potato starch. It's a blend of both thick and thin, just so when we add water to it, not all of it is just gonna be liquid. We're gonna make a wet batter. So the perks of having a wet batter is that you are able to get a crust that is shatteringly crisp. Instead of something that it's more crunchy, it's, it actually shatters. As opposed to a dry batter, it's something that's a little bit more crusty. Tiny's fried chicken 
is a blend of both wet dredge and dry dredge. Korean fried chicken uses potato starch instead of sweet potato starch. So that's kind of the difference, but it's very much inspired by both. And this is vinegar. And here I have a little bit of baking soda. So what baking soda does is once it goes in and we add vinegar to it, it's going to create a bunch of carbon dioxide that'll help bubble up the crust and make that shatteringly crisp crunch that we want. As you can tell, it's bubbling up right now, immediately. All the carbon dioxide is being created. All right, we're ready to fry. We hold it up by the feet. That's gonna fry for about six minutes, and then we're gonna let it rest for a bit, and then it's gonna fry it again for about three minutes. Double fry. So we're gonna throw it back into the fryer for the second fry. This is when the skin really crisp up. We're hearing texture. I'm gonna break it into half first. This is the white meat and this is the dark meat. What we're gonna do is slice it like this horizontally. So each piece has both white and dark. You don't have to choose. Fry is good. It's just uh, some starch has gone into it, but you know, it is what it is. It's still an R&D. We're still working on it. This is a whole boneless fried chicken. Sausage time. This is all the beautiful stuff we picked up from Deluxe Meat Market. Taiwanese cuisine is an amalgamation of all these different local and regional cuisines of places that have colonized Taiwan. Well, as far as I know, Taiwanese sausage is largely influenced by the Portuguese and the time that Portuguese colonized Taiwan back in like the 17th century. So this is the fatty ground pork. That's like a 50-50 blend. This is the ground pork shoulder. That's like a 90-10 blend. Fat back is, surprise, fat from the back of the pig. As you can tell, it's more solid. It's great for cooking. This is what they put in ramen stock for uh, tonkotsu ramen. That thickens everything up. It's just lard, unrendered solid lard. This is actually not on the menu yet. It took me two years to get to this current recipe for Taiwanese sausage. I want to make my own Taiwanese sausage because the ones I found outside, even with some wholesalers who are dedicated to making Taiwanese sausage, I couldn't find one with the exact consistency that I liked. The current version that we have is a Baijiu garlic Taiwanese sausage. All right, we got some sugar. We got some MSG, some sodium nitrite, pink salt. It helps fend off bacteria. Garlic powder, nice big jug. A little five spice. How do you know it's Taiwanese if there's no five spice? Uh, if you look at the technique of Taiwanese sausage, it's emulsified meat stuffed into hog casing. It's unique in Asian food. So, by Joe, same thing. We're gonna pour it in. Doesn't have to be too much. It really helps take away kind of any off taste you get from the pork. And because it's brining, alcohol kind of kills some of the bacteria that will eventually develop. So, we are good. Meat is nice and emulsified, ready to stuff. As you can see, it's, it's like a Paste. You can't really even tell the fat from the regular meat. Now it's ready. Natural hog casing. The goal is to make about 500 every week, depending on how good we get at it. I, I try to not hang them for longer than 24 hours. The pink salt start to really penetrate the sausage and it becomes just a little bit too salty. The Cantonese style sausage, the lap chang, is, is hung for anywhere from two days to a week. You're just curing it at that point. These are only air dried. You still want the bounciness of the meat. These guys have been hung for about a day. These were made 10 minutes ago. As you can see, the skin really dries up. That's what gives it the like snappy texture. We're going to poach them first for about eight minutes and then deep fry them for three minutes. In they go. 
We are still one of the only Taiwanese restaurants in New York. There seriously is only a handful, like less than a handful, especially in Manhattan. Me being Taiwanese, there is this invisible pressure placed on myself on really representing my heritage and my culture and my people. Whether I like it or not, everything is a reflection on Taiwan, at least to New Yorkers. And I don't take it lightly. This is Taiwanese sausage, house-made, with a fermented chive puree. We're about to put the pig's blood cake on the menu. Pig's blood cake, known in Mandarin as zhu xie gao, it's a widely, widely popular dish in Taiwan. It's kind of like the bagel of Taiwan. Everybody eats it. It's super traditional Taiwanese food. Impossible to find in America, at least done well. And so I sought out looking for fresh pig's blood because you have to make it with fresh, like liquid pig's blood. Took my Debraga rep about a month to get it to me, which is crazy. I think why we didn't do it in the beginning was because we didn't think New York was ready for it. I was very constrained by my perception of what people would like from Taiwan. But now I don't really give a shit. Sticky rice, this has been soaked overnight just to loosen it up a little bit uh, and rehydrate it. The blood helps coagulate with the sticky rice and the sticky rice releases some starch into the blood and it becomes something entirely different. A little bit of salt, a little bit of sugar, uh, soy sauce. And trusty little guy, every single recipe. The most important part is to soak each individual grain in the blood. It's crazy how it smells like nothing. Right now, the only smell I'm getting is the soy sauce and the baijiu. That just goes to show how fresh the blood is. So now we're gonna drop the pig's blood cake into the steamer. It steams about like 30 minutes. The steaming process coagulates the blood while cooking the sticky rice. In the end, makes it a single block. There's the blood that's coagulated, and then this is the rice that's been cooked. It has to cool overnight, just so everything kind of chills out, gets to mingle with each other in the fridge, and it becomes a more solid block once it chills. And voila. It is gorgeous. You see this? It's all just rice. It's rice and blood. It's pretty much it. If you look at the cross section here, this is what you're aiming for. To somebody who is skeptical about pig's blood cake, I would say try it once. If you don't like it, spit it out. It's fine. I believe everybody has the right to choose what they want to eat. But I think, especially in, a, in such a global society we live in today, you need to try it at least once before you declare that you don't like it. We're cutting it into triangles because it gives it more surface area. So the sauce for the pig's blood cake, it's not super traditional. We have sambal, fish sauce, sesame oil, and soy paste. The whole idea behind it is I wanted something that's sweet, a little bit funky, uh, but also very fresh and spicy. So we're also adding Thai chili, Thai basil, lots of scallion, lots of garlic, lots of cilantro. It's a dish that is best enjoyed with a couple of drinks. This is the spicy stir-fried pig's blood cake. What would I tell baby Eric about owning a restaurant? Other than trying to persuade myself out of it would be trust yourself. I think that's a very important lesson because for the longest time, I was thinking about what other people would want. And this really all ties back into being authentically myself. I think the beauty of opening a restaurant in New York is that there's so many people that are willing to be educated on your food and your culture. To open a restaurant thinking about what other people would want out of your culture is a pretty, pretty big misstep and a, and a missed opportunity, honestly. And I did that for a year, almost. Uh, until the pandemic happened. And now, I'm just like, it, I'll do what I want. And I've never been better.